In this episode of Influencers, former Morgan Stanley CEO and up close and all in author, John Mack. I do think uh, it's a big casino on some of these hedge funds. I think risk management has been taken to another level. We were so mesmerized by the great trader and the money they made that uh, they got more and more autonomy until it was too late. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, John Mack, former CEO of Morgan Stanley and author of the new book, Up Close and All In. John, great to see you. Thank you. Good to be here again. So I want to talk about the book, John, but first of all, you have been in the securities industry for many decades, right. and I have to ask you what you think is going on right now. What the heck is going on with the economy and the stock market and the Federal Reserve? your best take on things right now if you were sitting in that seat, say, in Morgan Stanley? Well, I, I think the economy's in good shape. I, I think uh, leadership from the Fed has been outstanding. I think people are much more attuned uh, how to tweak it and what to do. And if you look at the securities business within that environment, I think there's much more discipline today than you go back 20 years ago, or especially 30 years ago. I think risk management has been taken to another level. And I think the bet the casino kind of things that happened 20, 30 years ago when I was uh, directly involved, I think that's been cur curtailed. I think boards are much more involved than they were when I first got into the securities business. So I think the pressure on boards to really get involved has really paid off. I think CEOs, where they were you know, whomever it may be, let's go back to John Goodfriend, who was a very powerful guy and outspoken uh, and, and very talented. They ran these companies, even though they were public companies or had major shareholders, they ran as, I'm in charge, I'm running it, I'm going to do what I think's right. There's nothing wrong with that as long as your board is on board with you doing that. You know, some people, on the other hand, would say, John, oh, all that regulation, disclosure, filing with the SEC has gone too far and um, it's hurt the business. But you see it as being kind of a, a, a moderating force for good? Yeah, listen, when you say hurt the business, uh, has it taken uh, business or revenues away? Has it shifted capital raising process to Europe or Asia? Uh, in my view, the answer is no, it really hasn't. And I think the SEC has to be more involved. If you go back and look at the risk that we took 25, 30 years ago. And it was kind of way out there. And a lot of these firms, including some of the things that happened at Morgan Stanley, we were so mesmerized by the great trader and the money they made that uh, they got more and more autonomy until it was too late. We had huge losses. So I think the setup today is exactly what it should be. I think the Fed needs to be more involved. The SEC is more involved. I also think the level of uh, regulatory um, uh, diligence is much better than it was right. 25 years ago. But has the power focus switched over to private equity and hedge funds, and is that outside the purview of the SEC, do you think? Well, it, in certain areas, it is outside the purview. I do think... Uh, it's a big casino on some of these hedge funds. Uh, but again, they have no security blanket from the Fed. Uh, where are the banks do? We have certain responsibilities they don't. And I would say that, you know, a lot of people are invested in these funds because they want to take risk. And they understand, I could lose a lot of money, but they also understand we can make a lot of money. And I think the track record, just someone like Stevie Cohen's example, it's been spectacular and others are out there doing the same thing. So um, I think it's a good balance between mm -hmm. taking risk and having regulatory oversight. But the hedge fund managers that we have today, they've been doing this for 30 years. If you go back to when Julian Robertson was running his business, Tiger, that was kind of a new thing back then. And look what it's evolved in and how many hedge funds are out there and the returns that they have passed on to their investors. Jay Powell has, you know, to your point, John, 
obviously well aware of Arthur Burns versus Paul Volcker, right? So you have some confidence in his understanding right. of that era. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Right. That's exactly it. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, Credit Suisse, sure. where you worked. Uh, they're in the news uh, right now as uh, having some problems. It, it, it never seems like the European banks get it right. Is there something in the water over there as opposed to the United States, you think? How direct do you want me to be? <laughs> <laughs> Just between you and me, yeah. as um, they used to say. I, I think the Swiss, as you know, I ran Credit Suisse for a while. Uh, they have such a lock on bank secrecy. And who knows uh, what they're doing and how they're doing it. It's their nature. If you wanted to put money away and protect it, uh, wealthy people all over the world, governments, put money in the Swiss banks. And off that capital that they could borrow from, they were able to run great businesses. Their private banking industry is probably one of the best in the world. But the Swiss, not just the banks, the country, focuses on wealth accumulation, uh, wealth management, uh, bank secrecy. And uh, look, that's why from time to time, whether it's uh, when they own First Boston or they were owned by themselves, they always seem to find at some point too much risk with the regulators not being on top of it. I do think the Swiss regulators, though, are much more focused and very thorough as now they deal with the banks. Right. Let's switch over and talk about your book, Up Close and All In. Sure. Um, so many stories over the decades in here. Maybe take us back to start, John, back to the late 1960s when you okay. first went to Wall Street. Right. How is Wall Street different today from when you started off? Well, I think when we started, it was much more of a fragmented business, and there were more small uh, corporations or trading houses set up. If you, if you go back, you know, uh, Dylan Reed at one point had a lot of backing, great credit, and over time it didn't grow and finally got it absorbed. So if you go back to when I got in the business in the late 60s, early 70s, there was risk, but nothing like that was going on today or in the last 20 some years. The risk taking was really with a few big traders. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember some of their names, but some of the big traders, and that evolved into hedge funds. And then they took a lot of risk. Uh, the idea of being long securities and short securities gave you a little bit of insulation, but also I think they began to play the downside of the market. You know, people want to buy stocks because they go up, but sometimes you ought to sell stocks because they're going to go down. And, and the shorting became almost an art form, which eventually evolved to a big business called the prime brokerage business. And Morgan Stanley created a huge business uh, by, by doing that because the hedge funds, when they were shorting, they needed to borrow securities. And it allowed the banks, uh, whether it's Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Lehman Brothers, whomever it may be, to provide that service that they could short securities and buy the stock and make deliveries. So in the securities business, there's always been sales and trading on one side, investment banking on the other side. You were on the sales and trading side. Right. You had to bring them together. Right. What was it like bringing together those disparate cultures at a place like Morgan Stanley? Well, I would say it was a lot of fun. I mean, um, what I try to do is get uh, traders and bankers and salesmen together and talk about, you know, what's the goal? And the number one goal was to make sure that we did ethical business, to make sure that uh, insider information stayed inside, no one played around with it. And the way we started building the corporation of the three entities, we would do things together. So one of the things I would do, uh, I would host a lunch uh, every week, and the first 12 people, no matter who they were that signed up, came to the lunch. So the first lunch, the only people I had were people in the mailroom because they got the message first. So they all signed up. So then we figured out, all right, we have to stagger the emails so we can get other people in. But, but, but by doing that, we got sales and trade and investment banking, asset management, to be in a much more collegial uh, partnership and also help people do business by introducing, if I was a salesman and had a great relationship with a big hedge fund, 
But on the uh, equity side, I was doing fixed income. The equity guy was not breaking into them. I think what we tried to change is we are one firm and let's work together and we got people working together. And that was the secret sauce for the firm. There's arrogance on Wall Street, yep. I guess you think. Yep. Uh, and one story you tell is about a poor guy trying to deliver breakfast sandwiches right. to some guy and the Wall Street guy keeping him waiting forever. Yeah. How did you learn to sort of rein that in? Well, uh, n number one, I, I really, uh, I really give Dick Fisher a lot of credit. Uh, Dick, as you know, ended up uh, running the firm and ended up uh, doing the merger with me with Dean Witter. But Dick always uh, treated people with respect. And I remember, and maybe I've said this, I remember him saying to me, John, you have the biggest gun in the firm your job is not to use it. So to back off and be a little easier on people and not as demanding. So I also thought that people need to be treated with respect. So every morning when I'd come into work, I just wanted fixed income at the time, I was on the management committee. I'd come up the elevator, I'd get off the elevator, get ready to go to my office, and I'd look over to the doors that opened on to the trading floor. And there would be two or three people lined up bringing breakfast sandwiches or coffee or whatever they wanted to eat. And then I'd go to my office, on the, it was on the corner of uh, towards 6th Avenue, I'd walk the whole length of the McGraw-Hill building to go to the far end to listen to the traders' meetings and see what we were working on and what new issues may be coming out. And then I'd leave the meeting and I'd walk back to my office and all the way back I'd look over at that door that went in on the trading desk. So I don't know why I walked over to this guy. I said, how long you, because he looked familiar. I said, how long you been here? He said, I've been here 20 minutes. I said, have you called the person that ordered the breakfast? He says, I've called him three times. I said, give me the phone. So I called him and I said, John Mack, come out here. And he comes out and I said, listen, this guy is trying to do what you do. He's trying to make a living. And when you make him wait, you're taking money out of his pocket. If it ever happens again, you're fired. The beauty of that is, number one, it was the right thing to do. Number two, it went across the trading floor like a wildfire, and it never happened again. And I just believe you got to treat people with respect. And I think inherently I have that. But in watching Dick Fisher and how he treated people, it was a uh, graduate degree in how to treat people. And you made a trading error early in your career, and yeah. you were forgiven for that. <laughs> yeah. So is there a time to forgive people, too? You have to, yes. I mean, it's one thing to make a mistake. Uh, you've got to give people a second chance, I believe. It's another thing to be dishonest. And I think on dishonesty, you don't get a second chance. The merger with Dean Witter was obviously this very high-profile, high-wire act. It seemed like it was working, then it didn't work. There was friction between you and Phil Purcell. Take right. us back to that time. What, what went wrong? What went right? Well, what went right was the merger. I mean, it was the right thing to do. What went wrong is we didn't understand the different cultures. I mean, Dean Witter had a very um, control from the top culture. Uh, no one would go into Phil's office and say, you know, you can't do that, that doesn't make sense. No one challenged him. Whatever he said, they did. Uh, the Morgan Stanley culture was you speak up. If you think it can be done uh, in a more efficient way, a better way, a more profitable way, you would speak up. That just didn't happen. And the difficult thing was the two cultures just smashed together. And uh, if you criticize Phil, you know, you're put in the penalty box. Uh, my view is criticism is a way of getting to the truth. You don't have to agree with it all the time, but it opens your eyes to what's going on. So that was the difficulty. And uh, whether it was in the asset management business or the mutual fund business that they had, which was great. And, and I'll never forget, and I think this is in the book, um, Phil's the CEO, I'm the president, and I still did enjoy doing a lot of client visits. So I flew out to the West Coast to see Safeway stores. We had just completed a high yield bond offering for them. I wanted to go by and see the senior team there. But we landed, I think it was in Sacramento, and I had an hour and a half to kill. So what am I gonna do in Sacramento? 
So I said, well, take me to the Dean Witter office. And so I go to the Dean Witter office, and it may have been called the Morgan Stanley Dean Witter office. And I get all the salesmen together. I said, tell me what's going on. What are you doing? What can we do to help you? Just back and forth, back and forth. So, uh, you know, I fly back to New York. And uh, Phil and I are close by in our offices, and uh, I'm going in to see him. And he said, you know, John, you know, you can't do that. I said, can't do what? You, you can't just drop into a sales office, a, a retail office, and get people together to have a meeting. I said, I'm the president of the firm. What, what do you mean I can't do it? He said, uh, the, the CEO of, uh, of Sears, Ed Brennan, I think, was the CEO, he said, Ed Brennan would never go to a Sears store without calling the manager three or four days in advance and tell him he's coming in to see him. I said, Phil, this is not fucking Sears. This is Morgan Stanley. What do you mean? You, you gotta, it's not play acting. How do you treat people? So that, that was really, I think, the clashing of the two cultures. It was, it was very different. There was a uh, a culture of lead from the top, I make all decisions, which in some cases probably worked very well. And there was a culture at Morgan Stanley, as Dick Fisher would say, we like having a dialogue and arguing back and forth, and hopefully we get to the right answer. So that was that story. Right. And then you left Morgan Stanley, and then the angry old men came, and right. there was a coup, and then they brought you back. Right. And at some point along the way, you identified your successor, James Gorman, as someone who you right. thought would be the right person to lead the firm after you, right? Correct, I did. Well, well James had everything you need. Uh, number one, very smart, personal, uh, strategic. Uh, I'd spent a lot of time on, on strategy, and that's when uh, I think Dave Kamansky had hired him. And uh, I'll never forget uh, when I hired him, uh, he came aboard and I said, look, it's your show. If you tell me that we're, we can't fix retail, I'm going to spin it off or, or, or just sell it. Uh, and he said, look, John, we can fix this. And he did fix it. He's done a superb job, uh, not only on just retail, but in the presence of Morgan Stanley in the financial community. You know, I certainly don't want to skip over 2008, though. And, you know, that, that was, talk about a high wire act, that yeah. was the ultimate. And, you know, John, we've talked about this before, but you're saving Morgan Stanley through the Mitsubishi investment funding right. probably turned the tide right. um, in terms of the crisis. What, what was that moment like? You, you, you had to stand up and stand down um, to the Ber to Bernanke Bernanke Geithner, Bernanke. Bernanke. Geithner. Yeah. Um, well, it was stressful, to say the least. Um, I had brought my board in because I didn't know if we were going to make it. And of course, a lot of this also, uh, and I don't blame them, their job is as money managers to make money. And if the rules say you can short stocks and keep shorting them, uh, I guess you can do it. But I didn't, I didn't think at the time uh, we were going to make it. And uh, we'd reached out and I remember talking to Dick Fole because he's having the same issues. We talked to basically everyone, how are we going to get through this? I think Buffett had made a capital infusion into Goldman Sachs at the time. So when I talked to uh, Paulson and, and uh, Lloyd, they were comfortable with it and they were in good shape. So it was just difficult. And um, I remember bringing my board in saying, you know, I don't know if we're going to make it. And we had had conversations with the Japanese, and we were waiting to hear from them. But 12-hour time difference, uh, we had nothing to do for three or four hours. So we're watching the uh, St. Louis-New York Giants football game, <laughs> waiting for the Japanese to call. And the board's in there, and um, phone rings. I don't pick it up. My assistant picks it up. She comes in and says, John, uh, Tim Geithner's on the phone. He wants to talk to you. So I go over to the phone and I pick up the phone and say, Tim, um, I'd like to put my general counsel on the phone before we start this conversation. Um, that was just a ruse for me to put the speaker on so my board could hear the conversation. So uh, we get on, he says, look, John, you don't know how bad it is. We can't have Morgan Stanley go down. Um, 
I want you to call Jamie Diamond and he'll buy your firm. And I think I said this earlier, I said, yeah, for $2 a share. And Tim said, well, I don't care what the price is. Uh, I don't believe the Japanese are coming in and we can't have Morgan Stanley go down. So pick up the phone and sell your firm. And I said, well, I won't do it. I'll take the firm down first and I hung up on him. And again, uh, I think my board is speechless. But um, Gorman wrote me a great email uh, about that. And his comment was how much he learned in those few minutes. And listen, I think, look, I take risks. I don't think I'm a crazy risk taker. I have confidence. Um, sometimes I shouldn't have so much confidence. Um, I, didn't, I don't do the job just to do the job. I believe in it. And uh, when, you, when you're there representing, I don't know, 10,000 people, it's personal. And um, that's how I managed. And that's why I was, I was not going to just give in and take the easy answer out. And the easy answer was to sell the firm. Did you really mean you would take the firm down? I mean, what... I'm curious, I saw that line, and yeah. I was like, what, what did that really mean, though, John? That, that means, or that meant, mm -hmm. I was not going to call J.P. Morgan and sell the firm for $3 a share. Right. I, no, $2, Two. a share is what Jamie said. So at $2 a share, I'll just take it down. Hmm. Look, at the end of the day, my business life would have been ruined. But I've got a great family, got a great wife. I wouldn't have very much money anymore. <laughs> but look, my, my parents were immigrants. I mean, they came into this country, they could barely speak English. And, you know, they get off at Ellis Island and, uh, you know, they say, your name's Charles, uh, your name is Phil. And you, they got on a train and went down to, uh, he was trying to get to short Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a Syrian family he knew down there. And he gets on the train, he gets off in Marion, North Carolina. Train stops, he sleeps in the depot, and uh, one of the conductors gets him on the train to Charlotte where there was a Syrian coffee shop in the train station. And that's how we ended up in North Carolina. Now that's risk, and that's real risk. And he, he had three children, he had a wife. So to say to Geithner and Bernanke and Paulson, I'll take the firm down first, yeah, it's better than having cancer. It's better than you know doing something that gets you in serious trouble. It's better than losing someone you love. I mean, you know, in life, you take risks. And that was the right thing to do. And knock on wood, the Japanese had seen our culture and came through and delivered. And no one believed it would happen. And like James said in this email he sent me, he said, I learned more in those few minutes in my entire career. You have to take a stand. And um, sometimes you get lucky. Your rivalry back then, the key rivalry, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. Correct. What was that like? Did you communicate with the Corzines and the Paulsons and the Blank Fines? What was that rivalry like? Well, I really, I really like Corzine. Uh, we got along. We both came up on the fixed income side. Uh, I like Lloyd. He's fast. He's brash. He tells you what he thinks. I like that. Uh, Hank Paulson is smart, a gentleman, communicate probably more conservative than I am, but I thought the world of him. At the end of the day, all three of them, I believe, always try to do what was right. And, you know, people say, well, Goldman's really kind of uh, sharp elbows, pointed elbows in the equity business, and Goldman's this and Goldman's that. Every time we worked with them, I had no issue with them, and I liked him as a partner, and I liked him as a competitor. You have a lot of uh, work that you've done here in New York City in terms of philanthropic endeavors, the medical field. Right. Why is that important to you? Well, uh, again, um, I grew up in North Carolina, a town of, I don't know, 7,000 people, Milltown. And I saw my father, uh, when I was a very young age, would collect money from the uh, Lebanese Arabic community in Columbia, South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, Charlotte, North Carolina, and he would give the money to an orphanage called Boys Home. And he always felt, he felt an affinity to these kids who were in an orphanage. And I saw his generosity. 
And I saw it was generosity also within the community. Uh, I remember as a teenager when I could drive around Christmas time, my father ran a wholesale grocery business with my brothers. Uh, I would deliver food to some of the uh, poor families in, in, in Morrisville. It was a mill town, 8,000 people. Um, I would guess African-American, probably 30%. And I just saw how my dad treated people. So that kind of said to me, you know, uh, let's do something for the hospital that makes sense. And uh, when I went on the board, uh, I'll never forget this, uh, I was asked to go on the board, and uh, I think I may have mentioned it, and I first turned it down. I said, you just want money. I'll give you money. And they said, no, we, you need to be involved. Uh, and I got involved. And then uh, going up and visiting kids in the hospital, uh, I made the comment, uh, New York does not have a children's hospital. So I, I took six young couples, managing directors and their spouses, up to New York Presbyterian Hospital, and we went up and did a tour, and we did a tour of the neonatal care, which was on, I think, the sixth or eighth floor of the building. And if you'd been a parent and you saw that, you would be frightened to death wires and tubes and these poor babies, some just two or three pounds. So I said, look, for $3 million, we can renovate this whole little area. So we went back and we raised the money. And we had a celebration uh, dinner about it. And my friend Peter Karchus, he ran the fixed income division. I talked to him and I said, look, uh, I'm going to say we need to build a hospital. And I put that out and said, look, let's build the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. And Peter was in charge of raising money, and uh, he was as good as anyone I've ever seen. And it was the right thing to do. And if you talk to Morgan Stanley employees now, it's very important to them. Number one, it's the right thing to do to go up and volunteer. But as a culture, I think it helps the culture of the corporation. And you know, to walk in there and you see Morgan Stanley and all the people who gave money, and then our clients heard what we were doing, whether it was Drucken Miller or someone else would give money and their names are etched in limestone. So I think when you've been fortunate and you have the wealth, you gotta help other people. It's just part of my DNA. John, one thing you've always been so good at in your career is bringing people together. Um, but right now we're in a period of divisiveness right. in this country. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that and if you have any ideas on how maybe we could address that and bring people back together again. Well, I think the pandemic, we've got to be comfortable first, and that's going to happen. It's probably happened now. But Christy and I have always been uh, people who reach out to bring people in. And uh, one of the things that Christy has done in our townhouse, uh, we once a year we back the car out and go park it in, in a street somewhere. And she's very clever in that when she redid the townhouse, she put in black tile on the floor and sconces on the on the wall. So what we do, we bring a group in from California uh, and we invite our friends and our neighbors over and they do Christmas carols where we all sit in the garage looking into the foyer and uh, it's just a way to connect people. And what she's done at Duke for Integrative Health, mm. what she's done here in New York, we just believe uh, when you have the means to help, you help. Right. Speaking of Duke, you were on the board of Duke, and universities have all manner of challenges. And there's also, of course, the realignment of conferences and right. teams and all that stuff. And I wonder what your thoughts are on maybe college athletics at this point and, and how those things have changed so much. Well, I think college athletics, because of ESPN and ABC and other, other television uh, outlets, it's a money game. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you think about Mike Krzyzewski and what he built, and people are scrambling to be an advertiser when Duke's on ESPN or ABC or whomever it is. So athletics to me has, has really changed that when I was 18 years old and, and playing football. And the money game is big money. So I see it getting bigger and more important and helping these universities continue to build out their programs. But to me, the real question I have for universities, and uh, I'm not going to pick any one university, but I would argue that the top universities, when I'm a freshman, you pick the college, 
and maybe a sophomore, when I go to class after paying the tuition of 20 grand or 25 grand, I have a graduate student teaching me. Where are the professors? Are they working on their books? I think professors need to be teaching more and not assigning their graduate students to interface with the students. You're lucky if they're only paying 25,000, John. Um, so I want to go back to this book and ask you very simply why you decided to write it. Uh, where Christy and I go out, uh, have dinner with old friends or people that we had worked with or whatever, you got to write a book. You know, you got to do it. And it kept, it kept coming up. And I think, I think if uh, the crisis had not happened, I hadn't dealt with Paulson Bernanke uh, uh, the way I did in Geithner. Um, you know, it, it was hanging up the, who does that? No. <laughs> Oh, well, they I mean, made a movie about it, John, I right? Know. But, yeah, by the way, I tried to play myself in it. Let yeah. Tony Shalhoub do it. Tony Shalhoub played and it, right. He's a Lebanese character, Charles. So yeah. I said, Tony, let me play the part. You keep the money. I don't <laughs> want the money. He said, John, it's not enough money <laughs> anyway, so I'll just keep it. Right. You shouldn't do it. Right. Uh, that's, that's really what drove it. It was, how do you make that decision? Yeah, that is, that is the crux of, of, of your story, really. Exactly. And last question, John, what do you see as your legacy? What do you want people to remember you and your career as? Set an example of, uh, in business, directness and honesty, and help people who need help. Uh, When you look at the children's hospital and uh, what we've done, we, Morgan Stanley, and the people who built that, for these kids is unbelievable. Christy and I, as I said earlier, we, we, we took some of the Muppets up there uh, from Sesame Street, and it just you could see these little children who are just lying like this just come alive. So for me, and I think for Christy also, to be in a position of uh, having financial success and to give that back in ways of helping people. And what she did at Duke, and she, she does these things that, that I just find amazing. She came up and decided that she could make short film clips, mm -hmm. that when you're in bed and you know got nothing to do, you go to his doctor's office, you can watch a short film clip. And, uh, one of the film clips, and, and these, these are Academy Award winning producers made these movies. The short movie that I really like, these elderly ladies playing basketball. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's genius. And it's, it's a community and that's how you have to act. So I love what she's done in healthcare. And I love being married to her and my kids and family. And our legacy is you gotta help people who need help. All right. Couldn't be better said than that. John Thank Mack, you. former CEO of Morgan Stanley and author of this new book, Up Close and All In. Thank you so much for your time, Thank you. John. My pleasure. It's fun. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.